Hello, everyone, and welcome to chapel. Are you guys ready to make some money and support TC Athletics? Yeah. Well, it's me and Maya are here to tell you about an amazing opportunity where you can do both of those things. All right, everyone, listen up. So this Saturday, February 1st, we're hosting an opportunity called the Three Point Shot Competition. All you need to bring is $1 to play, gym floor appropriate shoes, and your game face. How it goes is you pay $1 to shoot the ball from outside the three-point line. You make it, we give you $2. If you miss, you can either pay to play again or go back and sit with your mom. So come here Saturday night at 7. Get your money up, not your funny up. So now we'd like to transition into a time of prayer and worship. So help me welcome Mr. Royce. Thank you. Welcome to Chapel, everybody. I'm excited to be here at Troy Christian Chapel, where our mission is to create a community that is living like Jesus together. Here at Troy Christian, we believe we are disciples. We're not just people who've made a decision once to pray one prayer to God and call it, you know, call that our Christianity. We are disciples, people who are learning Jesus' lifestyle, who are actually living like him, actually obeying what he teaches us to do, actually changing our lives in the ways he wants us to change. But we're not only disciples, we're also family. We are family here. Whether, you know, whether you like it or not, you are born into a family and you're kind of stuck with the people you are stuck with. Um, and that's kind of how we are with each other. <laughs> We're here and we are our brothers and we are our sisters. But we're not going to become family on accident. When you're not born into a family, you're not, you know, you, you, when you're born into a family, you just kind of wake up into it. But when we're trying to create a group of people into a family, it takes doing a few things on purpose to lead us deeper into family-like relationships. One of my favorite things we do here at Troy Christian that turns us into a family is when we stand together before worship and we throw our arms around each other and we pray together. The reason we do that is because it reminds us that we're family. It reminds us that we are not just a bunch of individuals who are on individual relationships with God, who are on individual journeys, but that we are in this together. And even though I love when we do that, standing up together and praying together, I actually want to do something a little different to start this chapel. One of the things I want us to move closer to is being more familiar with prayer and becoming more comfortable praying over each other. I, I want us to move closer to a place where praying over somebody is a normal part of your life and a normal part of your faith. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to love others. And I am convinced there might not be something, I can't think of anything more loving that you can do for someone that everyone's equipped to do than to pray over them. Because when you love someone, you want what is absolutely best for them. That's what true love is, is when, when you are just committed to seeing their very best life actually happen and for your actions to line up with that desire to see what's best for them. Can, and what can be better for somebody than for them to live out the life and the calling that God has for them and to live in, a, in the relationship with God that they were designed to live in? And prayer is coming to God and saying, God, I want this person to live the life you have called them to live. I lift them up to you, bless them, lead them to, to your, what you have in store for them. 
And so here's how I want to do that. In a moment, I'm going to set my mic aside and I'm going to give us a, a few minutes. And I challenge you, I invite you to just find one person. Find one person here. Staff, you can participate in this. Guests, you can participate in this. Worship team, you can participate in this on stage. Find one person and pray over each other. What does that look like if, if it's some, you know, if you, I'm assuming you're going to find someone you know and you won't need to ask their name, but ask them, is there anything I can pray with you about? And one at a time, just put, put your hand on the person's shoulder and say a prayer for them. And I challenge you to pray this prayer out loud because it, it, is, it is encouraging when you get to hear someone pray for you and so for us to be encouragers, we want to pray out loud so the person we're praying for hears that encouragement. And so I'm going to put this microphone away for a second, and we're going to get up and find someone to pray for and pray with each other. I'll, I'll then interrupt that time to transition us to singing. So let's pray together. Thank you, everybody. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for participating in that. I believe that when we become, when the, when, when the people of God become people of prayer, we'll start to see God do new things. So stand with me as we get ready to, to worship. Go ahead and throw your arms around the person next to you. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending the Son and thank you for sending the Spirit. We just take this moment to recognize that this is a sacred moment. That this is a time where we are here to approach you. That this is a time where we are opening ourselves up to your spirit and to your presence. That the holy God of the universe is here among us and within us. And that we have the chance to encounter you and to be encountered by you. May this time of worship and this whole chapel be a time where we lose ourselves in making you feel loved. May this be a time where we lose ourselves in expressing how desperate we are for you to change our lives, for you to change our friends' lives, for you to change this school, and to make this place a picture of what heaven could look like. We believe in these things, and we worship you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Until the storm has ceased, your voice will rise above the seas. We will not fear, you are still God. Here in the waters deep, your hand will always be beneath. We will not fear, you are still God. We lift our eyes to you.
Thank you everyone for worshiping with us. And now I'm gonna give it to Ty Jack for prayer. That was awesome. You know, I was just gonna pray and let us hear the message that T-Jack's gonna bring to us. But uh, God laid something on my heart and you see like what it says back here and it talks about relentless pursuit and that's what we're supposed to do in our relationship with God. But the amazing thing about God is that he's in relentless pursuit of us. You see, have you ever been like chased by something that you haven't wanted to be chased by? And, and what do you naturally do? You just start running. You run as fast as you can. You get away from it. And know, you know the last thing you would do when you're being chased? The last thing you do is stop because what happens? They catch up to you. But it's different when it comes to God. It's different. Because there's so many hearts in this place that have messed up, that are worn, that are tired. And they put on this face every single day that says that they don't want God when deep down they can feel it in the heart that they know they need him. And my heart's break for those people because I was there. I was running and I did not want to stop. But God is telling us to stop so that he can catch up and we can turn around and we can be in a relationship with him and so that we can pursue him. He's telling you to stop. He doesn't care where you are. He doesn't care. And he wants us not to care. He doesn't want us to fix ourselves. He wants to fix you. I know so many people in this place that say they know Jesus, but do you really? And I hurt for you because I love you. God wants you to stop today. Today, he wants you to stop. He wants you to turn around and he wants you to see his face and truly understand who he is and know him and have a relationship with him. So when we're talking about relentless pursuit, let's not forget about how God first relentlessly pursued us. And if you're not yet pursuing him, then he's still chasing after you. And all you gotta do is stop and be in his presence because he's right there. He's right here. <laughs> My heart breaks for this place because I didn't know that I was ever gonna be here to begin with. But here I am because all I did was stop. And now I just wanna be here to tell you that I know how many of you have a hard heart towards God and I can see it, but I also know that you're being tugged and you're being tugged from behind because God's getting closer and he's just asking you to stop. He's asking you to stop faking it. He's asking you to stop making fun of others for relentlessly pursuing him but messing up. He's asking you to stop because all he wants is you. He doesn't want a different version of you, he wants you wherever you are, no matter how broken you are. So I just wanna give you this opportunity. If you need to create space from people next to you that you feel like if you respond, they're gonna be those people that get you to keep running. Because I know how that works. I had people around me that I knew if I stopped, they'd keep running and they'd look back at me and make fun of me. But I'm here to tell you that there is plenty of people in this place that will not make fun of you, but rather they'll turn around with you and they will encourage you to stop and be there with God. Those are the people you need in your life. And now I have them and I want you to have them too. So it's up to you. So if you need space, just from someone that you feel like will just keep running, then do that. And I wanna ask you to pray with me. Pray out loud if you need to. And just pray a prayer of saying, Lord, I'm stopping. I'm done. Because no matter how hard you try to fulfill yourself with joy, it's never enough. 
Some days I'll go thinking that I'm the happiest person in the world, and then all of a sudden I just get rocked, and I have nothing there to pick me back up. But God is that person to pick you back up. So separate yourselves and just pray out loud, and I'll I'll close this in prayer, and we'll go into the message, and just pray a prayer of stopping for God. Let's pray. God, I come to you right now and I just pray over as a collective group that we, as a school, as a family, we pray together that we just want to stop. We want to stop and we want to turn around and we want to see your face and we want to seek you. So I pray that the people in here that just decided to stop would be intentional with hearing the words that God is going to speak through T-Jack and that they would be bold enough to respond. Lord, I pray for the rest of these days, Lord, that this would be a reminder that we need to stop running, Lord. I pray that over everyone here and Lord, I pray that you would just move in this place and cause change and cause boldness like we've never seen before because you are able. Amen. Man, (laughs) how do you even, how do you even follow that, Tyler? (laughs) The Spirit's moving in this place already. I was, I was praying about this for days. I was worshiping for days on my own. And, and when you get in a room full of people who are doing the same and you're asking for the same thing and you're seeking the same thing, the Lord starts moving. Tyler, thank you for that. That is exactly what we needed to hear today. And uh, it's funny, just this morning I was praying, I said, Spirit, there, there are things that I wanted to say that, that I'm not the right one to say this. <laughs> and he provided. So thank you. Uh, wow. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Glad to be back with you. Kind of a, an intense start to our morning. For the last few weeks, I feel like we've been headed in a really good direction. I feel like it's been very positive that we, uh, we've started taking some steps, right? as a school and as individuals. Uh, We've been talking about this idea and moving toward a direction of discipleship, true discipleship, not just this place of of making a one-time decision and calling it a day. Mr. Royce and Mr. Liebarger, love both of you, by the way, Uh, they got us started thinking about all of this, and I think Mr. Liebarger particularly hit on something a couple weeks ago that, that kind of, uh, it was important to me. This idea that Bonhoeffer had of cheap grace, that we can't have one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. It just doesn't work like that. that we can't claim to follow Jesus and, and believe the things that he says, but then when he gives us a command, when he gives us a step to take, we just leave him on read. Thank you to Ava Linder, who explained the term on red to me, by the way. (laughs) Uh, So this need for a wholehearted approach to our faith led us to the series that we're in part two of today, Relentless Pursuit. No graphic? Okay, come on. (laughs) Tech crew. Because if we're going to become disciples of Jesus, that's what we need. We can't just agree with him. We, we have to believe and follow. It's going to require us to be in a lifelong, unending, unyielding, relentless pursuit of him. So I think last week, Mrs. Rowe did a fantastic job of breaking down for us some of the heart and the desire that's necessary to have if we're going to live a life guided by the Spirit. As an aside, I just feel like this needs to be said as, uh, as a member of the chapel leadership team here. Mrs. Rowe 
I'm constantly blown away by your heart and your spirit, wherever you are, there's bright lights in my face. Uh, I'm, I'm blown away by the way that you let the spirit lead you. And it's, it's been just a huge impact on me watching that. So I think one of these things she specifically shared last week is worth mentioning again. And it's kind of where I want to pick up today. Uh, Jesus isn't after a hand raised in worship or any song that we sing unless the heart of worship is behind it. As we talked about from John 4 last week, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We have to give him our spirit, our whole self, and we have to do it authentically. So when Mr. Royce asked me to speak in chapel this week, here's what he said to me. He said, I want you to talk a little bit about worship because I remember the way that you were in high school and I see the way that you are now. And I think it'd be good to hear about what changed that. And he's totally right to say that a lot has changed. I was the exact kid he was talking about at the beginning of the month. I was that decision, not that disciple. I was living out the small amount of faith that I had in the most selfish way possible. I treated this little decision I made when I was like six like it was uh, this, this cheap grace thing. I was in the cheap grace camp. It was just my get out of hell free card. I was the rich young ruler, but I wasn't rich or a ruler. <laughs> So I don't know why I didn't give up what I didn't have. <laughs> but that's what we all do, isn't it? And I didn't want to follow Jesus if it cost me any of my earthly labels. I wouldn't do it. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be someone respected. I wanted to be someone adored. And, oh yeah, I guess also a Christian. Not the other way around. Not a Christian first, and then, oh yeah, he also happens to take some sweet pictures. I treated Christianity like it was the side hustle, like it was the thing I had to do to pursue my real passions. Like in this metaphor, my faith was driving for Uber, and people liking me was the thing that I was like really caring about. I cared about my faith only as much as it kept me out of hell. And if I'm being totally honest, I think there are still a lot of us that struggle with that. It's a thing that I talk about from time to time. I call it checklist Christianity. We live our lives with only enough conviction so that we're able to sleep at night. That's all we care about. Our goal isn't relationship. It's to avoid a consequence. And as a result, we only do the bare minimum required. We build a list in our heads, and we think of all the things we absolutely have to do in order to be a good enough Christian uh, and we only do those things. Pray a prayer when I'm young, check. Sing a song occasionally, check. Uh, feel kind of guilty when I'm mean to people. Check that one off, right? Uh, tell people I'm a Christian, only if they ask, check. We build up this checklist. We keep a running tally in our head because our hope is that if ever the day comes that Jesus shows up here, we can look him in the eyes and say, I paid my way out of hell. I did all the things that were asked of me. And we know that's not what God is about, don't we? We know that he's about our heart. It certainly tells us that in the Bible enough times, doesn't it? The book of Micah tells us that he isn't content with burnt offerings, rivers of oil. Even if we were to give up our firstborn, that's not enough. What does he tell us? He says, he has shown you, O oh man, he has shown you, and what does he require of us? To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. This isn't the only time we see this. David, a man after God's own heart. Somebody that is given to us as an example of how to love God wholeheartedly says, you do not desire sacrifice. He would give it if he did. You do not delight in burnt offering. Instead, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Even Jesus tells us this. We see in Luke 21 just this small vignette. Uh, we've got the rich are at the temple and they're, they're dropping off gifts, probably pretty lavish ones. They're rich. And then this, this widow, this small elderly woman, 
walks up, and all she's got is these two tiny copper coins, and she drops it. And Jesus tells us that she's put in more than anyone because she went all in. She gave out of her poverty. She gave out of what she couldn't afford to give away, she gave to Jesus. It's the heart of the matter. And what I'm saying is this. I don't want us to get the wrong idea about where you stand. If you've already started moving toward the things that we're talking about, being a disciple, that's great. But I know this was the case for me. When we first get into that place of pursuing Christ, when we first get into that discipleship mentality, it's easy to start list building. It's easy to think that our, com- our following of the commands is going to be the thing, and we don't have to get them involved. So I tell you, never lose sight of the fact that your heart is the foundation, your actions must be built upon, and Jesus has to be in the picture. The Spirit's got to be moving in you. If your love for Jesus is not the thing that moves you, if you're just moving based on, I'm going to do things and hope that it works out, you're living out what I call a transactional faith. What do I mean when I say transactional faith? I mean that for the longest time, I read this passage right here. Nope, wrong one, Jacob. There we go. Uh, Jesus talks about this. He says that, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What I'm talking about is people who read this verse and go, wow, what a shrewd business move. What an investment. And that was my mentality. You're walking around and you just trip over something so valuable, you'd be foolish not to pick it up. It could pay off every debt that you have, every financial burden lifted. Of course, you would do what it took to get that thing. And for most of my life, I missed the part of this that really changed my faith, the part of this that made my faith worth having it all. And it's two words. It's the words for joy. I keep waiting for the words. Voice. (laughs) For joy. Those are the words. You see, it's not enough to have a head knowledge of what Jesus did for you. Transactional faith will never make you happier, and it will never lead you to a real relationship with Jesus. All it's going to do and only for a brief time is pacify some of the anxiety we have about our own mortality. As long as we live into this faith that's I do a thing, I do a thing, I do a thing, I think I'm good, that's going to go away. When my faith was only transactional, when my faith was only about not going to hell, my life was desperate. It was quiet desperation. It wasn't hope. It was numbness. And when it wasn't numbness, it was terror. It was fear, because suddenly that checklist becomes an obligation and a crushing one. You can never cross things off as fast as they appear back on that list. You can't do it alone. And so our faith is a constant, relentless pursuit of the one who relentlessly pursued us. It's a constant pursuit of not just him, but joy in him, excitement and delight in him, a deep satisfaction in him. A pastor that I listen to all the time, John Piper, he talks about this idea. He calls himself a Christian hedonist. I don't know how you feel about that term, but uh, he, he says that Christianity is about pursuing joy in him. And the other day I was listening to this message of his. He said, if your joy comes from the world, its benefits, its comforts, its kudos, you're like a leaf in the wind. Yours is not a serious joy. It's a secondhand joy. If you're not catching this, he's saying, if you're waiting for the approval of other people, if you're waiting for them to tell you who you are, what you're about, if you're good or not, you're not free. That's the thing. Serious joy sets people free, and it makes them the most secure and subversive people when it comes to cultural control. You aren't worried about that anymore. When you pursue joy, you aren't hung up about what anyone has to say about you. And you aren't paralyzed by your fears. They don't hold you in place. You aren't looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's watching. You aren't worrying about whether or not you measure up to make it out of hell. You're caught up in a wild, unyielding, scandalous love with the creator of all things. A love that you, by the way, get to participate in. It's not a love of constantly receiving, receiving, receiving. It's a love that you get to give. And really, is there anything better than that? Those are the deepest loves, the loves where we get to share in that to take part in that. I used to treat worship like it was a life sentence in heaven. 
a horrible process of spending 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all eternity singing hymns, and it would barely be better than being burned alive day and night. Just barely, <laughs> just a little bit. But when I pursued joy in Christ, when he started giving me his joy, when I started seeking out the giver and not just what he had to give, something wild happened. I was given a desire to worship because worship isn't just this act of singing a song. It isn't just this thing that we do once a week in here, once a week at church where maybe we throw a hand up. It's a lifestyle and it's an attitude toward our Father. And he isn't looking for that ego boost. He isn't just that. He isn't needy, right? He doesn't need some dumb 28-year-old high school teacher in Ohio to tell him how great he is. That'd be like you get home and like an ant is there with its hands lifted toward you. You'd be like, kind of cool, I guess, but not really something that you like care about. He's, he's not here just for that. He's here because our worship is a, is a back and forth act. It's giving him praise for the good things that he does and him raining delight back on us. C.S. Lewis says this about worship. This changed the game for me. He said, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it's expressed. Yo, let that sink in. The delight is incomplete till it's expressed. We can't fully enjoy a thing until we start expressing the joy in that thing. Think about the things that you love. Music, movies, sports, video games, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, tropical smoothie. <laughs> That's just me. Um, <laughs> no, you, when you don't get to share that thing and your love of that thing with someone, it, you feel blocked inside. It's like, anybody ever had that moment where you go to show someone a YouTube video or a meme that you just found, and before you can even get two seconds in, they're already navigating to their own video to show you? It's like that feeling that you get then of just like, oh, no, 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 I wanted to, like, I wanted to express this joy in this thing, and you're taking it away. And so worship is an act that's participatory on both sides. It's not out of his pride. It's because he wants for us to experience that delight in him. He's always about our good. He always wants what's best for us. And what's best for us is to delight in him. So why wouldn't he want that? So the question becomes this. What do I do if I want to pursue joy in Christ? How do I get there? Here are my suggestions for you. The first is this. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. This is what David says in the Psalms. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What I mean by this, and what I think the Bible means by this, is that when we take the time to make God our priority, our number one, the thing we're running after, he rewards us with more of him. When we learn to spend time with him and appreciate who he is, he can begin revealing new things about himself to us. And every layer deeper you go, every little new thing that you learn out, it's, it's more joy. It's more delight. It's unending. You just keep going deeper and keep finding new things. So I ask you this, same thing I asked you the last time I was up here. How in the world are you going to love somebody that you don't know at all? How? That's pretty hard to do. So spend time with him in prayer in reading your Bible, in praising him, in talking to others about him, in talking to people who know him already. Ask where he's at. This is how you're going to learn to delight in him. Ask him for more of him, and he will reward those efforts with more of him. The second thing I think we need to understand is this. If we are ever going to have a real relationship, anything that goes beyond just commands, if we ever want to get real with anyone, but especially with Jesus, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be open. We cannot be closed off. And I realize this is about the hardest thing I could ask of you. 
I realize that nothing else I say today is as difficult as this one, and I realize it because I spent nine years, the last nine years of my life have been just this. They have been a slow struggle to open up, a slow struggle to not be closed off. Brene Brown, who is a psychologist who, who kind of talks a lot about shame and vulnerability, says this, the bottom line with shame is the less you talk about it, the more of it you have. And if that isn't the realest thing I've ever heard, I don't know what is. That one wrecked me when I heard it, because I had all the shame. Here's what I want you to know. Shame and secrecy and judgment and keeping all of your feelings bottled up, it's only going to hurt you in the long run. It's only going to wreck you up inside. It's only going to slowly drain you from within. If you put up walls like I did around yourself, yeah, you're going to keep some hurt out a little bit, for a time, for a season. When I refused to worship because I was ashamed of my voice, because I was ashamed of the way I sounded, because I didn't want to look stupid up here with everybody else, because I was sarcastic and bitter and closed up inside. It's true. Not a single person made fun of me. When I wouldn't come up and raise my hand, when I wouldn't come up and raise my voice, nobody looked at me differently. When I stood there, still arms crossed, just bitter at the world. Nobody cared. But the part of me that wanted joy and hope and love, instead of pain, it had no way in. Understand this, when we build walls around ourselves to keep out pain, we keep out any possible goodness too. When we close ourselves off, we're closed off to everything. That's the thing. If you're paralyzed by the fear of the people around you and what they think, you will not now or ever move closer to God. You're going to stay put. You're at the end of your leash. You're going to go exactly as far as you've already gone. They say that a goldfish grows to the size of the bowl you put it in. And once you, you put it in a giant bowl, it gets huge. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know this much is true. You will only grow to the size of the walls that you built around yourself. The walls you put around your heart are a container. And it's not going to get any bigger than those walls. So start the work of breaking them down. And when you realize that you can't do that alone, because you can't do that alone, none of us can, ask him for help. Will he not give it? Is he not good? He's going to work in you. He's going to break it down. Because that's who he is. And he wants your heart. He wants relationship. My final point is this. It's been an intense month here in chapel. It's been one that's rocked a lot of us to our core. And every week I've seen more of you come up here for prayer. And to see you kneel last week was a blessing. You want to become a disciple? The next step is simple. Take the next step. You want to pursue joy? You want to be more vulnerable? You can't stand still. No one builds an intentional relationship with Jesus by accident. No relationship of value ever comes about by being still and doing nothing and hoping it all works out. Dallas Willard says, if you want to grow spiritually, Start by doing the next right thing you know you ought to do. Nothing, nothing will drag you into the kingdom of God like doing the next right thing. Meditate on that. This is a time that we are taking intentionally to do that next thing. We are taking the time to listen. We are taking the time to be intentional. So ask yourself here and now in this present moment, what's my next step? And if you're struggling with that question, ask yourself this one, what wouldn't I give up for God? I, I want to make sure that I'm clear about this. Asking that question, what wouldn't I give up, is not me up here telling you to go home and break your phone with a hammer tonight. I'm not telling you that now is the time that you have to get every piece together, that you have to go from mustard seed to mustard tree. 
I'm talking about the next step. And for some of you, that's not a thing of, I need to watch less Netflix. Maybe for some of you it is. What it's about is a thing that I've had to deal with constantly and I'm still dealing with. What fear will I let stand between me and you? What thing am I holding on to about myself, about the way people view me, about how I relate to others? What's going to stand between me and you? It took me until I was 25 years old to get baptized. And that's not because the desire wasn't there. It's because my constant concern was how people were going to look at this guy, especially as I got older, who hadn't done it yet, who had been in church for such a long time and hadn't taken that next step. That was a thing that weighed me down and choked me up inside. And God placed in my heart that still small voice that said, what are you going to let stand between me and you? What thing won't you give up for me? Am I not worth more than that? Do you not love me? And I had to wrestle with that. And I got there. It wasn't until just two years ago. And keep in mind, this is seven years after I like dedicated my life to the Lord. And I was like, I'm in. It took me until two years ago. I was already a Christian school teacher before I even threw my hand up in worship for the first time because I was terrified. And it was the smallest, most meager, like, all right, here's a hand. Do something with it, I guess. And now I'm just like, I'm all in. I don't care. If I look stupid and if I don't have rhythm, that's okay. They can deal with it. It's me and you, Jesus. There's no condemnation in Christ. There's mercy for every slow, meager step. There's mercy for every stumble that you take, every time that you, you just can't. The key is this, moving forward. As long as we're moving forward, that's relentless pursuit. When the car breaks down, you get out and walk. You keep going. You don't let anything hold you back. That's relentless pursuit. That's what a life with Christ is like. This is the life we're calling you to. As Paul would say, you got to keep pressing on for the prize of the upward call. So right now, this is your time. And staff, visitors, anyone who's here, it's not just for the students. It's not just for them. This is just as much for you because it's just as much for me. We're going to go back into worship. Here's what I want you to do. Take that next step. For some of you, it will be moving past your fear of worship. And maybe for the first time you raise your voice. And maybe for the first time you raise your hand. So if that's you, you're going to come up here and you're going to worship. Or you're going to stay where you're at and you're going to worship. Just take that next step, however small it is. Others of you, it may be asking someone for prayer. Maybe that's something you've never felt comfortable doing because you know that in you, that feels like weakness. We have people who are so ready to pray with you. They'll be up here. Or if you're not comfortable with them, if you need an even smaller step, a half step, find someone you are comfortable with. Grab them by the arm softly and say, hey, <laughs> not too hard. Will you pray with me? Will you pray over me? You don't have to get into anything specific either. Just take that first step, however small it is, take a step. Maybe, maybe this is you. Maybe you're one of the people that Tyler talked about. Maybe there's bad blood between you and somebody else, or maybe you're a stumbling block for somebody else. Maybe the person you are in here with your hands raised is a different person than the person you are in fourth or fifth period or the rest of the week. Maybe you walk around in here and you're like, Jesus, I love you. But out there, you're ready to just do whatever it takes to get somebody's heart, to get somebody's approval. Start dealing with that in your heart right now. Start praying about that. And maybe it's just kneeling where you're at and saying, Lord, I want to be vulnerable. Make me vulnerable. Open me up inside. I'm not going to tell you how to spend the time, but I'm going to tell you that the gym is open. You can go anywhere in here. This is a consecrated space, and this is a consecrated time for this purpose. So go where you need to go, and in the love of the Lord, press on. Let's take that next step here and now.
here's what I want to say to you. I think this is something I'm sensing in the spirit right now. There are some of you that are out there that are the kind of kids I was and the kind of kid I still am sometimes who, who are waiting for that, that call from God, who are still a little bit stuck, who are still a little bit passive and are still saying, I don't know if today's the day, maybe next time. Consider this your call from God. Consider this him saying to you right now, move. Because that's what he's saying to each of you. The time is always now. So whatever that thing is that stands between you and him, consider this whole place, the altar, and lay it down. We're going to go into one more song. And if you still need to stay and pray after that, do it. But this is your time. You and God, he's after you. He wants to work something new in you. So as we sing, whatever it is, give it.
I didn't want to, I know it's time to go. But there's something so amazing about worship in that as we tell him who he is, he tells us who we are. And I think he's doing that for some of you right now, that he's redefining who you are. And that some of the lies that you've been believing about yourself, that it's too late, that you're a failure, that you're always going to be stuck in that thing that's got a grip on you. That's not how he sees you. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as holy. He told me once that I'm perfect and I know I'm not perfect, but to him I am. So I, I do want to, I want to sing that way maker again, but as you're singing to him, let him tell you who you are. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that can. God, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Yeah, I just feel so strongly that some of you, it's not too late. <laughs> It's not too late. You're not stuck in that thing. The powers are already on the inside of you. You are righteous. That is who you are. Because he gave that to you. Because he made that in you. So the, that thing that you're doing that you don't want to do, that's not you. And you have the power inside of you. That's who you are. You're righteous. You're righteous. Let's sing to him one more time. We make miracle work, promise keep, hide in the darkness, my God, that is who you Jesus, that's who you are. We love you. We trust you. Yes. Yes, Lord. Keep speaking, God. We're listening. Thank you, Lord. He's a promise keeper. Every promise. Yes. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
God, we just thank you so much. I honestly could stay here all day, but I know we, we I really could. Whew, I love worshiping. Um, Mr. Royce, do you want to dismiss or what do you want to do? Let's, uh, let's keep an attitude of prayer for a moment. And as I, I was worshiping, I felt this sense uh, that the Lord was asking us a question or he was trying to get us to think about something specific. And, and for a lot of us, the next move that we needed to make today was in here in worship. For a lot of us in here, the next move we needed to make was to pursue you in this room. But I think the Lord's also wanting to remind us that the relentless pursuit of him goes beyond these walls. That the relentless pursuit of him continues in the hallway. It continues when we interact with each other. The, the way we speak with love and encouragement to each other, the way we, we make our decisions based on what he would want us to do, that the relentless pursuit of him is not just in this room, but it carries with us all day. It affects every decision we make. It affects how we spend our time. It affects what we think about. You're not, we're not meant to worship in this room and not worship in our home with a closed door. And some of you, the next step, there's a next step that needed to be made in this room and then there's also a next step that needs to be made outside these walls. And so I just invite you to take a moment and ask yourself, what is my next step beyond the walls of this chapel? What is my next step beyond the walls of, these cha of this chapel? What does it look like for me to relentlessly pursue you outside of this room? Make it clear to us, God. Prayer is not just talking to you, it's talking with you. We wanna listen. Guide us to our next step. Lead us, move us, and give us the courage to move. Heavenly Father, during this time, I just thank you for what your spirit has done. I thank you for how you've used this time to make a difference in our lives. May it go beyond these walls. May we know what the next step is for us, May we know how to relentlessly pursue you beyond the walls of this room. Be with us the rest of our day. May this not be a memory. May this be something that lives into our future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's... <laughs> Praise God. Hey, we, we are dismissed. Please uh, stack the chairs on your way out. We have a few people up here. If you need someone to pray with, there's people up here who would love to do that for you. <laughs>